Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. We talk to Kathy Shire, who is the mother of Susie Webster, who you probably just listened to. So this is her mom, who she talked about in her episode. So because we were so curious, or I was so curious, we had to interview her mom, and it turned out they're both award-winning quilters together. How cool is that? Um, And her mom does applique and uh, paper piecing, and it was a great interview. Oh, and there's a kid in it, too. Look for the kid, or listen for the kid. I'm Kathy Shire, and this is my daughter, Susie Webster, and we live in Apple Valley. Apple Valley. Apple Valley where? Minnesota. Minnesota. Apple Valley, Minnesota. All right. And we had interviewed Susie, and because she had talked about you, I was like, we have to call, we have to talk to your mom, too. (laughs) So (laughs) she said, um, so we're going to ask the first question. Susie, do you remember what your answer was when I asked you what was the first memory of someone sewing or quilting? Yeah. What was your answer? Uh, The first time I remember sewing was playing with mom's half square triangles, but I remember watching her sew for years. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, Kathy, what is your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Um... Believe it or not, well, sewing, my mom always sewed, sewed us clothes and stuff, and I learned to sew clothes as well. But quilting, I discovered on our long honeymoon trip, really? which uh, visited my in-laws, and she showed me the quilts that her mother had made. Wow. And I totally fell in love with it. And we, when we arrived, we got married in California, and we traveled cross country and visited with the in-laws and the other relatives and then we settled in Minnesota and within the first week that I was in the motel I bought a quilting book in a drugstore and started making pattern out of a Cheerios box that's just really... like instructed wow and what year what year is that that was 1977 1977 so right in the midst of the kind of renaissance the sort of this whole 1976 77 78 period where quilting starts to become a thing you're yeah. discovering it right at that moment. Right. But you have to tell her about the fabric. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's said to buy cotton fabric. Okay. So I bought cotton velveteen. Okay. And then I decided to put London fog rainwear on the back. Interesting. And this quilt weighs about 300 pounds, <laughs> but it's going to last forever. Forever. I mean, it's 40 years old and there is no wear and tear on it. That is really great. I was talking to someone, I think yesterday, when they said their first quilt was made out of polyester. And they're like, it's going to outlive and outlast everything on the planet. Uh-huh. <laughs> They'll be like, they made quilts out of polyester. <laughs> because it will be the only one that survives. Yeah. Um, that's funny. So, 77, what did the quilting world look like in 77? You know, I had no idea because I started out of a book. Yeah. And I started doing my own thing. And I don't think I took a quilt class for seven years. For seven years. So until the mid 80s. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And do you think? I think it was six years before I discovered that there was a group called Minnesota Quilters and went to my first meeting. Wow. And after six years, I went home and I told my husband, Okay, we can stay in Minnesota. Really? Yeah, yeah. because you had yeah. found a group. I that, found my people. You so. found your people. And did have you stayed yeah. with that group? Yeah. You have. I'm still a member, and I took my first class from one of the founding members. I've taken classes from some of the other founding members, and I've been taking classes, and I even started te- doing some teaching for a while. That's amazing. And so my think? husband says, you know, each year you quilt more and I go yep that's right that's right (laughs) yes yes I understand that that's pretty interesting when was the guild founded um I think it's it was founded right when we moved here because it's 40 years old this year 
Uh, so like 19... 1977, the Guild is founded yeah. in 1977. Yeah. You start quilting but don't know about them in 77. This is so interesting, right? Like this is like we really – I really want to understand this history part of like all this activity that's starting to – like the guilds and all of that. That's so fascinating. So tell me about your quilting life. When do you – um. When do you start using a rotary cutter? Okay, that was one of my second quilt. I used a rotary cutter. It was just invented. I don't know how I found out about these things. I mean, Interesting. if I saw it in a magazine or whatever, but I found out about the rotary cutter and I bought one and it was fantastic. And I cut up all sorts of scraps I bought from Joanne's without regard to quality of the fabric. So that quilt didn't last more than six months. It really. But it was fun. That's really interesting. Um, and then sort of how, like, so take us up to now. So tell us about your quilting life now. Like, how would you describe your style and what you do and sort of who you, who are you as a quilter now in 2018? Okay. Um I would say that mostly I'm known for my applique. Yeah. And I did mostly hand applique up till about three or four years <laughs> ago. And now I'm uh, switching mostly to machine. Yeah. Because I'm tired of waiting to get the projects done. I want to start too many other <laughs> projects. So the and machine so seems how, to be a how do you, more. How do you see, I just interviewed someone about applique. What is it about applique that you like? What what draws you to applique? I don't like straight lines, matching corners, yeah. and all the the putsy little things that you're supposed to do if you're just piecing. I yeah. find stitching straight lines rather boring. Be boring, yeah. Um, and I can sit down. I've been uh, working on a new applique quilt that I'm designing. And once I get started on an applique, I can't stop. So I have to make myself get up, do a load of laundry, let my yeah. arms rest. A let your bit, arms rest. I used to yeah. be that way with um, with cross stitch. Um, when I was in uh, law school, I had a, this huge, big, huge masterpiece cross stitch project, and I would quilt. I mean, I would cross stitch so long that my husband, my new band, baby new ha- husband, would have to massage my hands because <laughs> they get all crampy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the way you feel yeah. with with you know? You're gonna be like, I gotta get up. <laughs> I got it. I got to take well, a break. As soon as there's a little bit of pain or achiness, then it's time to get up and do something yeah. different for a while and then come back to it. So, but mostly I like applique. I still like handwork and I'm doing English paper piecing. Yeah. Um, do you like that? Willing, the Passacaglia. I did that one. Say, uh, say it again. I talked over you. I didn't hear what it was. Tell me, tell me what you did. Pass- there's a lady named Willine, W-I-L-L-Y-N-E, Hammerstein, I think. I don't know exactly how it's pronounced. And she's from the Netherlands. Uh-huh. And she started um, this great big trend doing English paper piecing with Penrose tiling. Okay. And it's really humorous because about, I don't know, 15 years ago, my husband says, here, try to make a quilt with this. And he showed me an example of Penrose tiling. And basically, it's got five-sided and ten-sided figures. The and so all the seams are every which way. And talk about set and seams. Everything oh, wow. Is oh, my gosh. I just got okay. to it. And okay. I looked at it, and I go, I don't know how on earth to approach this. La Pasagalia so quilt? Is that no. what it is? So I put it aside, and I wasn't going to do it. Uh-huh. And then Willine came out with her books, and everybody started doing it with pa- a lot of people started doing it with English paper piecing. Uh huh. So then I decided, well, I can do English paper piecing. Right. So I've been doing the. I did the cover of her first book, and I'm doing the cover of her second book now, and I'm sure I'll do several from her third book as well. That's cool. I've just I see them. I've seen these. I've seen these out in the world, but I didn't know what they were. You uh-huh. fussy cut the fabric so that it makes an interesting pattern. Yeah. And it's like a kaleidoscope like kind of it's thing. It's like right? a kaleidoscope exactly. Yeah. And it's a lot of it's a lot of fun and a totally different mindset and I'm having fun exploring, you know, when do you have enough contrast and when do you, when is it too light and too dark and the first one I made uh they were just just before she published her third book. 
and they had an exhibit in Houston and they asked for people to send pictures of their completed uh, quilts uh, for a contest and they would pick 30 to go to Houston and then they'd pick eight to go to France. So I go, I can do that, I'm almost done. So I sent off my almost done picture and then I ended up that I did get into Houston. My mom oh. says, well, if when you when your quilt goes to France, we're going too. And I go, yeah, right, mom. Yeah, my quilt went to France, it and my did? mom and I got to go to France. You did? Yeah, oh. and it was it was an awesome trip. It was so really- your your quilt got picked to be at Houston, and then and- it got picked to be in at, in France. And you uh-huh. went to see it. That is amazing. It was it was amazing, and it was you know everybody's. I've seen lots and lots of them, and they all have their own personality. Now, these it's scare- like yeah, it's like your color choices yeah. and your uh, the way you combine fabrics and the palettes that you like. It all comes out. And you, I mean, I can, people can walk up to a quilt and they know it's my quilt. They know it's yours because of the sort they of style. Will mine. you send me a couple of pictures um, when we get done? Because I'd love to see yeah. them. Sure. Uh, that's really cool, and we we make a page for you, so I would love to um, have them as part of your web page on our, awesome. our site. Um, how do you on these? So, I'm just trying to be scrappy. I'm trying to be a little more scrappy. I'm having a hard time, but I'm 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 trying to be scrappy. Yeah. These seem like hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so these seem like it's really about how you put the fabric together. Yeah. Um, and fussy cutting and the precision of it all. Um, do you feel like, how hard is that to do? That looks really hard to me. It's, it depends on how perfectionist you are. I'm not a total perfectionist. It doesn't have, to me, the design and what's happening is more important than how perfect it is. So... I'm using English paper piecing and you sewing those points together. And sometimes they're exactly right. And sometimes they're not exactly right. And I'm going, I don't care. I'm just going to make it as good as I can. And that's it. And keep going. And it was, so the, and it was good enough to, with, so yeah. I think, yeah, I think I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that's a really super, super important point because I think the stress of getting things right in this in the, and as a hobby is really overwhelming, but you feel like that you try to do your best and your stuff got to Houston and France. So, yeah. I mean, obviously you're really good at what you do, but also we shouldn't be so stressed all the time about perfection. Is that what you're saying? What? You, we shouldn't be so stressed about perfection. Is that what no, you're saying? No, I, I, you know, I, I enter a lot of quilt shows and I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to get a quilt into a show. And and I have a, a s- small amount of ribbons up on one wall. But that to me, that's not the important part. The important part is like the reaction of people when they see your quilt and they go, oh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for what the judges think about how my binding is, which yeah. I flunked even though I've taken two classes, but I'm going to take a third. <laughs> so we'll see. Maybe we can get that in order. But to me, it's not a, it's not about how much you sweat and how, how much you get everything just perfect. I mean, yeah, for a show quilt, you want to get everything perfect. But to me, it's more about making a quilt and having somebody love it and yeah. use it and, smi- and makes them smile every day. And that's where I'm at. Yeah. All right. So I have a bunch of questions off of that. First, tell me why. When did you start entering your 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 um your quilts into shows? And also, why do you do that? Like, why is that important as part of your quilting life? Um. First, it makes me. I, I hate to admit this, but it makes me finish something. Oh, I have this bad tendency. Like, if I make blocks. 20 blocks for quilt and they're all the same if I finish one block that quilt will never get done I have to do (laughs) I have to wait until the end to see what the quilt block looks like or else I won't keep going that's funny so that's what I'm look you know that's the part that excites me is what's it going to look like when it's done if I know in advance then it's all over then you're bored yeah so a lot of times um I I decided I'm not going to enter quilts and shows anymore and I have this beautiful quilt done and the binding's half done and I can't make myself do it, so I entered a show, so I have a deadline to finish that binding, so it will get done this week. Oh, that's interesting. So that's so, a motivator. So that helps me, like, gives me the push 
the extra push to finish that last part. And also, I like to share what I'm doing so yeah. people can see what, you know, people can see my quilts and enjoy them. And I like to see other people's quilts at the shows, whether they're the big winners or not. It doesn't matter. There's always something interesting in that. Each interesting and what quilt. shows do you like like if someone's listening out there like what shows do well you like i go to the minnesota quilter show because it's close i've been to the aqs show in paducah a few times and i'd love to go again but i i can't go to all of them you know yeah. and i went to houston and i went to go once and i fell in love with the overwhelmingness of it it is I really lovely are you are you, I you come every year to, oh that's so great go every year. so we have we're gonna have a a booth there. So we have a booth for our thing. So you, now you have to be part of it. You have to come hang okay. out with us. It would be great. Uh, we can't quite figure out what we're doing. But we're going to have, like, you know, you know, yeah, it'll be great. I keep wanting. We're going to have a booth uh, the week of the show or the week of market? Uh, the show. We'll have it for the okay. show. Yeah, yeah. we'll stop by and see you then. Definitely. Hang oh, out. Good. That's right. I keep saying that I want to get a big couch and have it just want to sit. That would be. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like it. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. We need sitting places where we're at the show. Let me tell you. Totally. Right. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, we've got, yeah. So yeah, come by and, um, we're going to start planning it. Are you part of, are you on our Facebook page? Are you part of the group on our Facebook group? No, but I need to be. Cool. Well, um, we're going to start planning that. So I would love for you to, um, help us with that too. Just, uh, throw in any thoughts. So we, we what the booth is, um, we're supposed to be, uh, selling things but we're not sure exactly what that means so we're figuring that all out um that's the opportunity that the booth gives you as a nonprofit. so right all right so i have more questions about this so when you do the paper english paper piecing do you um order the little pieces or do you i did i do? did order the little pieces from paperpieces.com yeah and it's fantastic because it is, right I, okay i can't cut anything the same twice. I do a lot of applique and I know that I never cut the leaves exactly the same. Yeah. So to uh, so it's nice to have them uh, laser cut and they're just right. They're perfect, right? So and I order the plastic templates from them and I and I use the glue. And it's interesting you? there's a uh, You use the glue to put I, them together? I use the glue. You do. I tried sewing, you know, basting. Yeah. Through the paper, and that was very hard on my hands. I'm getting a little old to do that. Well, and the shapes so are so weird. I needed a better way. It's cheaper, but I don't care what the glue costs. If I had to sew through the paper, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then it's the water-based glue, and then once you – when do you take the papers out of it? You wait till I it's all done? I like to try to get the entire quilt together before I take the papers out. Maybe I'll take a little bit out, but I want at least – three or four bands around the edge so that I can pin it up and decide is the next fabric really the one I want to use there or not. Interesting. And how big are these when they're... A design wall. And that's been real helpful. You have a design wall? That's great. Yeah. I put that off for about five years after somebody told me I had to have one and I should have listened to them right away. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And how big are your quilts when you make these quilts? (laughs) She's laughing at me. Okay. Well, um, these these English paper piecing quilts are for wall hangings. I don't want them on bed. Uh-huh. Okay. So, and they're made like wall hanging size. They're not made king size. Yeah. Howsomever, my usual size is king size for yeah. quilt. Oh, my gosh. So I have a phenomenal amount of king size quilts that I've made. And now <laughs> I'm making a lot of queens and some twins. Wow. And I'm throwing in throws and doing baby quilts. and So... I make all kinds, and the closets are all full, uh-huh. and the cases by my sofa are full, and I'm running out of room for all of my quilts, so whenever the relatives come, I go, look through what I've got and see what you'd like to take no, home. That's, that's absolutely love. You should have, have lots of them. visitors. I would, that's yeah, really yeah. nice. So the, the whole, all the relatives uh, come and visit us now. We're not going and visiting them as often. That's very so, nice. uh, so I give a lot away. Uh, there's some friends of my daughters that I know figured the little girls would love some quilts, so I made some quilts, for, quilted up some quilts for them. I finally decided I'm keeping them as tops, and then quilting them before I give them away as gifts because yeah. 
it takes up less room that way. Ah, very I don't clever. know if that's a good idea or not. Totally. That's very clever. Yeah. Now, what's your, quilting, I, what's your what? quilting life like with your daughter? What is it to be a mother-daughter quilting duo? Oh, it's just amazing because if I get stuck on it, I can't decide on a color, then I call yeah. her. If I don't can't figure out how to piece something together, I call her. And, and vice versa. If I don't have the right fabric, I can go over to her house at nine o'clock at night and find the piece uh-huh. where the we stores are placed. supplies from each other when we run out of something. Yeah. Really it doesn't nice. happen very often, but it does sometimes. But it does happen. That way. She, she has a little bit different taste in fabric, but she does more boutiques than I do. So I do a lot of them. But I use more of a mix. And she'll always have the color I need. Always. And I pretty much will always have something if she needs something. That's right so cool. Away. So you it's go, fun. And we on. talk about quilting every day. Every day? Yeah. yeah, every day. And I wake up and I, if I don't have anything on my quilt frame or something on my machine ready to go, I'll sleep until six. But if I know I have something going, I'll wake up and go, I want to applique now. <laughs> so that's why I get out of bed in the morning. So. I always say I don't understand people that don't have a passion or a hobby that they love yeah. because why do they bother to get out of bed? Yeah. Yeah. I so I have a story for you. Good. I love stories. I sent you pictures from my email address. Okay. Um, did you just send them? I did. Okay. I sent you pictures of her English paper piecing, but I also oh, sent you cool. a second quilt that has a story. Oh, my gosh. So okay. we I were in Houston them. one year. Your place is in charge. And we were looking at the group quilts. And my comment was, we could compete in this, but that means we needed a group. <laughs> and so uh, obviously mom and I were part of the group and we, we, we hooked into our friend Janelle, who is a, an amazing paper piecer. And we decided that we were going to work on a quilt for show together, the three of us. And so we spent a long time, probably a year and a half, yeah. designing and piecing and getting the quilt top complete. And then we kind of looked at each other and none of us wanted to quilt it. I didn't want to quilt it because it was so large. And mom didn't want to quilt it because she just wasn't comfortable. I was afraid of ruining it. I totally and get so it. then we talked, uh, we strung arm one of our friends out in Colorado into helping us quilt we it. We met her in Houston. Yeah. She's usually our roommate. But uh, the uh, mom's goal, she thought the goal was to, uh, well, finish the quilt and enter it. My goal was to win a ribbon in Houston, but... <laughs> That's beside the point. So we entered the quilt, and I must admit that I had not seen the quilt other than in a little picture um, over the internet since we had sent it to the quilter. And so we entered the quilt in Houston. It was its first show. And the four of us uh, at that point lived in three different states, Minnesota, Texas, and Colorado. And we promised each other that if we got it entered and it took a prize, that we would all be there for the award ceremony in Houston. Have you been to the award ceremony? No, I haven't. No, no. You, need to, you should go because it's an experience. It's like going to the Oscars. They really? have lighting and it's just craziness. It's fun. That's great. Um, so anyway, uh, so we're sitting there in the audience because they tell you six weeks ahead of time if you've won a prize. But they so don't we, tell you what. They have no idea what we won. We just know we won something. So the four of us are sitting there next to each other waiting. And they're going through all the categories. And of course, ours was just about last. Just I mean, about. there's 23 categories. I think we were 22nd. And so what they do is they, on their big screen, they'll show you a picture of the third place quilt and the second place quilt. And then the first place quilt, they have moved from the show floor up to the auditorium. They have a covered in velvet curtains. And when they announce first place, they lift the curtain and shine a spotlight on the quilt so that you can see the actual quilt in person that took wow. first quilt. And so we're, it's really we're, an we're counting curtains going, is the curtain going to be big enough to hold our quilt behind? Because <laughs> we weren't sure. We had no idea. And so sure enough, they get to our category, third, second, we're jumping up and down because then the curtain lifts and there's our quilt. Oh, and my gosh. That is so and it was great. Just a moment. Oh was my gosh! How did you feel? Sharing with my mom and my two good friends was just 
fantastic. It was fantastic. That's unbelievable. So how did and it all feel? the things I said about perfection did not apply to this quilt. This yeah. quilt was perfect. This was yeah. perfect. To the last detail. And it was hilarious because we made these half compasses. Is it and purple? I was Is it blue and purple? Set. No, it's the other one that's it's on, uh, black. It's on black. It's on black. Okay, hold on. And lots of bright color. Because the purple and red, one is gorgeous too. All right, hold on. Turkey. But anyway, it's got some half compasses, which is a half, basically a half of a circle. Yeah, and I, I was going to set them in to the black. And I had one chance to get this right because if you cut it wrong, then you're you're hoax. But anyway, I figured out how to do it. Don't even ask me. I don't remember. I don't it remember. Was how it, it was a very traumatic experience. But I looked at him and I tried to figure it out. And I go, something's wrong. These aren't a, exactly a half a circle. Sure enough, something was wrong with the original drafting. Really? And we didn't have extra fabric. We took those apart and fixed them. Wow. And I fixed the points of them four times until I gave up trying to fix it so that the point why it was in exactly the right place. This is beautiful. So, so uh, you can send me a so, picture and we'll post it on. If you're okay with it, I'll post it on the yes. webpage. Um, yeah, that's totally cool. fine. Yeah. So, that, so that's where, like, perfection is worth it when you're... When you're I didn't want to let well. my teammates down. That <laughs> I don't usually... Work that hard. I don't usually work that hard, and I don't usually take paper piecing apart and redraft the paper, and then use the same pieces again. It's because, gorgeous. Uh, so it's got paper piecing. The the quilting the is incredible. Is and that the applique? Are the, the applique of the flower. So it's got a that was all, that was done by hand, and yeah. Susie designed it, and then we both did some of the hand applique. And then my friend digitized the quilting, Lori in Colorado. Yeah. And it's just perfect. I mean, she did such a good job. Every time I look, I told her, I go, every time I look somewhere new, I see something else you did. It's just cool. That's so cool. So, now, what where, what happened to this quilt after it won Best in Show at Houston? Like, do you just... That's you just at like, Houston. That's at MQS. At MQS. Oh, at MQS. That is so amazing. At MQS. So then what happened to it? Well, we decided that we'd share it and we'd each take it for a while. I think Lori has it entered in one more show sometime this fall, and then it's probably done touring. Most show quilts tour for about two or three years and then they age out. Yeah. Because um, they there's like there's certain years where a quilt can be finished to be entered in show. Yeah. Um, it's and years. you know it's about time that we probably need to have that conversation. Yeah. So, but she's been entering it in shows, one here, one there. We've gotten quite a few blue ribbons on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't ribbon, and that's just part of the gamble. That's yeah. interesting. That's just part of the game is is having yeah. it and sort of seeing but where it... It was entered in MQX, and, and we knew we'd won something again because they'd sent us an email. Uh-huh. And uh, they decided to, for the first time, live stream the award ceremony over Facebook. So Mom and I are sitting there watching the live stream, and I had a couple of other quilts entered in the show. And so we'd see my quilts come and go. And... Uh, they're getting towards the end and we're looking at each other going, they haven't talked about our quilt yet. What's going on? Where's our quilt? And then they announced that it won best machine quilting and we were very excited. That's very cool. And then they announced that it won best to show and um, there was some screaming going on and <laughs> my family came running because they were just not sure what was going on. And I don't think I slept that night because I was so excited. That is so cool. Oh, that's really amazing. Wow. This is amazing. I love it. It's so cool. All right. But, and- you know, that's, that's one kind of pleasure that I get out of it. I love making the quilts and designing them and picking fabrics and playing around. But another one, I gave a quilt to a young girl, and she was adopted by an American family out of Hungary, which is where I was born. So I wanted to give her a quilt. And she picked up that quilt. And she put it around her shoulders and laid down on the ground and started rolling around and a big smile on her face. Aww. So to me, that, that's as important yeah. as winning a ribbon at show. Interesting. Uh, no doubt about it. 
That's really I, I amazing. Really I love it. Now, tell me a little bit about like, do you help your mom? Did you help your your daughter? I always call my daughter my kid. So, it's, so I was about to say, do you help your kid? Do you help your kid with um the right? She she writes books, right? So with what? With writing. So what about the book writing? So doesn't Susie write books? And am I right? Okay, you're, you're breaking up. Second. Try again. Sorry. So, what do you feel like? There's a professional aspect to what you do. Can you hear me? Yeah, there is for my daughter. She likes to write. I yes. don't like to write. Right. And do you help? In what way do you do you feel like you help her in any way with the books, or is that her own thing? Oh, the, the books are her own thing, and I'll I've uh, I'll do things like proofread. Yeah. I think everybody in the family proofreads their books. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. And um, and some of the, her friends and I make suggestions like you can't just use the colors you like because then people who don't like those colors won't buy your book. <laughs> you have to use what you colors? have to use some. Do one in reproduction. She goes, I have to, and I go, Yeah, you do. That's very funny. I love <laughs> so it. We, we make comments, but no, the professional part that's her. That's, that's all hers. Her. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And I sort of pinky back along you once you in a while out. and do a trunk show or something, but <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. And then what about like quilt tourism? Do you guys feel like you go on adventure together or go to quilt oh, shops together? Oh, yeah. We went down to Missouri Star. This is like another thing about something I want to do once. Uh-huh. So we went on spring break and like spring break is too early in the season in Minnesota. So the weather here is lousy. It's uh-huh. just the ground and everything and so we want to go far enough south so that we can feel assured that the good weather is coming so we drove down to missouri star with my two children with yeah. the two kids and we stopped at you know parks and we stopped at a train museum and we had a wonderful time at missouri star and we stopped at a lot of other quilt shops and then we came home and said yes it's warmer down south we know it's going to happen <laughs> that's really great now year. how did it go but with the- it was so fun yeah so we went a second year and we went we took them to the denver to the De- des moines science museum yeah. and the des moines zoo and we went to the omaha zoo on our way back so it's just sort of a trip with the Missouri Star being the farthest point. That's really great. Now, what do you do with the kids once you get to Missouri Star? Because there's a lot going on there. Do they have like okay, a my, kids that are? My children are well trained to go into quilt stores. Because you see, when we go on road trips, we don't stop at rest stops. We stop at quilt stores and use the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, they each get to get a fat quarter whenever we go into a quilt store. So they have their own quilt stash. That's great. That they have not necessarily done a lot with, but it's allowed to me to go into the quilt right. store. Right. Now that's so that's fine. Very clever. And so uh, they like looking at fabric and helping us pick it out, and uh-huh. they'll pick up a bolt. Mom, do you like this one? And sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're not. And they have fun trying to pick out which fabric they want. That's really but great. They knew we were going to spend forever in the boutique store uh-huh. because that's just my thing. And we took a book and a drawing pad in with us and they sat <laughs> on the floor and did that because we were in there good. over an hour. <laughs> that's really great. Now, how do the quilt shops react to your kids? Because we've been having these conversations about quilt shops not always being kind to people they don't think are you know, their customers kind of thing. Like I see my kid as, as my kid spends a lot more than I do in a quilt shop. Um, but sometimes I have to explain to them that, that she's the buyer, not me. Um, do you ever have any trouble with the, because you have two boys. Do you ever have any trouble with the boys in a quilt shop? With the you quilt know, shop? every once in a while they'll yeah. get in trouble because they're running around. Yeah. Um, they don't tend to do that when we're out of town. That yeah. tends to happen more locally in shops that they're familiar with. Yeah. One in particular. And uh, then, you know, mom and I will take turns. One of us will go outside with the boys and yeah. then when he's done, we'll flop. Well, what about the quilt owners? Because I totally get their boys and their kids and that's what kids will do. Do you ever have quilt shop owners that aren't nice to the kids? Because that's our... No, that I never ever have. have. That's never. great. Because they usually see the pile of bolts that I'm buying. And- <laughs> <laughs> They're willing to <laughs> overlook it. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's very funny. Like, quickly identify you are going to be a very good customer. And they know how to behave because they've been in so many. Yeah. Interesting. 
Now, what do they? Can I, um, can I ask your kid a question? What's his, yeah. What does he gravitate to? What kind of fabric do you like? He likes fabric that's got interesting geometric shapes. Interesting, yeah. And he likes fabric that has rainbows, like has lots of different colors in yeah. it. And animals. And yeah. animals, yes. Very cool. Love it. Love it. So where's your where's your quilt you made? Yeah, you want to show where your quilt? I would love to see it. In your bed. Go get it. That's so, so cool. I'm teaching him to, I'm letting him use my long arm. I saw pictures I online, yeah. I think. I think I saw yeah. pictures. Yeah. I was great. And I was just amazed how much he already knew. Really? Mom. It's See? just amazing. Like, oh my gosh, look at that. Not to get himself stuck in a It corner. is gorgeous. It's. I think it's batiks and it's rainbow and it's got all kinds of things. Here, I have to stop talking and then it will get bigger. Hold on just a sec. You have to say something and then it will get big so I can see it. Okay. Hey. So he quilted his name. He quilted um, jellyfish, jellyfish and, 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 and mushrooms. That's... And my name is right here. See, that's his name, Roland, right here. That is so great. And he did, you did and such all, a good job. The only thing I taught him was, you know, if I say stop, you have to hit this button right away. Yeah. So if the machine stops. I said, and then I'll start it for you, and then you grab the handles from me and keep going. That is so cool. He was off like a shot. He knew not to back himself in a corner and how to get out and fill the rest of the square because he filled one square at a time. And I was shocked. That's amazing. A beginning how... person never knows those kind of things. Yeah. So how, how, old how old is he? How old is he? Evan. And he's an artist in his own right. Yeah, That's he loves amazing. to draw. He draws and he does it constantly all day long there's a pencil so interesting well i've got this theory so people keep saying like how do we get the next generation to sew all these sorts of things and i really believe that if you could like get that kind of equipment into kids hands early um they we would have incredible fiber artists and we would like it would be a new generation that that you it's the equipment giving them access to equipment is so important in this conversation it's huge huge and it's interesting i am As part of our school carnival one year, I offered make a pillow with Mrs. Webster as one of the prizes you could buy. Uh huh. And so I had two girls who are apparently, um, it was an auction type <laughs> situation. They were going back and forth, um, bidding it up. And uh, finally, one of them bought it and then invited the other one to come. I said, bring a friend. So the two of them um, and I stayed after school one day and I had arranged for their parents to come pick them up at five o'clock. And uh, stop that. And uh, so I'd arranged for their parents to uh, come pick them up. And we just, I had pre-cut the strips to make, you know, piece together stripes to make pillows. And they'd each told me what kind of colors they liked. And I just picked fabric from my stash. And they had so much fun piecing it. And they, you know, wanted to iron it. And when we sewed them together, they each went home with a finished pillow. And they had a blast. And I hope that, you know, those two girls remember that and someday um, try sewing again. Yeah, so we get this we get this question a lot, and there's um, one person in particular that keeps asking us for, well, just ha- has asked us a couple times about what do we do to reach that, that younger generation? And it, I would love for you to chat with us more about that and sort of strategize about sort of, you know, do you go directly to schools? Do you have special programs? Sort of what is it, how do you reach, because their concern is that there isn't home ec anymore. But I don't think home ec was doing what pe- people thought it was because so many people no. are like, I hated home ec, I failed home ec. It was only, late, it's almost like a trauma moment yeah, for because, a lot of people. Yeah, um, I found a home ec was a trauma and I already knew how to sew at that yeah. point. Yeah. So I don't think that's the answer. I mean, I think it's like, you know, giving them access to really, like, you know, kick-ass uh, equipment. But I I would love your idea, especially as an educator. Um, we're trying to put a group together to sort of brainstorm on what our recommendations would be. Um, and I know a lot, some of the shops have classes for mom and kid to yeah. make a pair of pajama pants or a pillowcase. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Generally, if the mom is sewing... The kid is exposed enough to it. Yeah. That maybe they'll pick it up. It's the ones whose moms don't sew that don't go into the quilt shop. 
yeah. that aren't getting the opportunity. Yeah. So uh, sometimes like they have Girl Scout troops will come in and do a pillowcase class, which I think is fantastic. And I you're getting a wide range of children that way. Yeah. I thought that maybe if they did stuff on like uh, Minecraft or cosplay or other things that would connect to what they're doing, that that might be another way to reach them of uh, things they things that already they like. But I don't know. So interesting. Your your kid is amazing, and that that quilt is amazing. That's just like yeah. it 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 shows you at what the possibilities are. You sort of see kind of wow, like right. you know, we just got to get more kids connected and having these these moments, you know, of. Um, so I have another story to tell on her. Yeah. Oh gosh, cool. <laughs> here we go. So no, it's not a bad story. It's, it's a good story actually. So. Um, I was doing a lot of hand applique and some piecing, and I did some half square, square triangles, but that's as far as it went. I had never done a Lone Star with the diamond shapes, uh-huh. and frankly, they scared the tar out of me, and I wasn't sure I was ever going to do one, though I thought they were pretty. So she'd done like one or two little things, and then the next quilt she wants to do is a Lone Star, and she wants to do it with diamonds that are about maybe would fit in a two inch square yeah and i'm going oh my gosh she is really biting off more than i would want to handle Uh, but i can't discourage her i just gotta let her do it so i didn't tell her i was frightened or anything and she made that quilt and it wasn't perfect but it was beautiful and i still have it oh yeah i didn't know that (laughs) that's really cool Uh, so uh Sometimes I think that approach is way better than the traditional home ec approach. Like yeah. the basting isn't good. You've got to rip it out. It's not even enough. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, who cares? Right. You know? Well, my but, other idea is like to have, we really want a clubhouse. Like that's, I'm trying to figure out how to raise money for a clubhouse. I found a building. It's really a messed up building. <laughs> totally want to buy it. Um, but um but the idea of having a space that like is intergenerational, that kids can hang out and all the different generations can hang out and that it's like a family as opposed to a class. Because I think that it's just different if you're like, hey, I want to make X or anybody want to try the long arm today or, you know, it's just more casual. Just like come hang out and make something. Um, yeah. it, I just feel like that's how, at least that's how I learned, right? I'd just be like, I'm bored, mom. I want to make something. Or I've got right. an idea for something. Um, as yeah. opposed to structure of class. Class just is boring um, to me, at least. Uh, but of course, I'm a teacher, so maybe that's what I think is boring. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to be in class. <laughs> My cousin Lisa lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah. And they have a maker space. They do. And I'm not sure exactly how it all functions, but I know that they have all sorts of equipment. They have sewing machines. They have a laser cutter. They have. That's what I want. Uh, yeah. A makerspace. They have yeah. welding and pottery tools, but it's, it's kind of a buzzword in education right now is the concept of a makerspace. Right. Right. Um, and she says, you know, I, I think they pay dues so that they have access and, you know, have to pay for, you know, electricity and whatnot yeah Um, but then you know i know she offered uh some sort of a class you know to people in the makerspace to make i think it was a fleece scarf or something um but i thought that that is a very organic way to get people into all sorts of different things i I totally agree yeah so here's my my dream. I want the well. First, it's a really cruddy old bar and grill in the Bywater that this like needs a ton of work. But the idea is to have a maker space on the bottom, and then on the top have um a ho- like a rooms like Airbnb but like hotel space on yeah. top. So you could have um visitors come in and hang out with us. So that it would be both like community and people you know the quilting army and famous people and people that don't even know about us um staying with us so you could all hang out that's kind of the idea at this point oh, but, neat. yeah um because yeah i think the maker space i think it's about being in your pajamas and hanging out and you know, yeah. like like it's that like it, my mom used to say it's quantity of time not quality and so that's kind of the idea behind it to have a maker space that you could also sleep over yeah yeah, so I don't know. We'll see if we get there. 
Um, well, this is. So, great. are they really worried that the next generation isn't picking this up? Yeah, really worried. Super worried. There's a big, big worry because um, they're worried that the sewing industry will the uh, people the people sewing will will get smaller. And then there'll okay. be a problem with, you know. Because that happened with, like, making clothes. Uh-huh. Like, people quit making clothes, right. basically. And then quilt making came along, and, like, most of the machine places are in, a lot of them are in quilt shops nowadays. And there's a revitalization know? on the quilt, on the fabric, make, the clothes making, too. People are making their yeah, clothes and again. Yeah, and that's coming back. In fact, I used to do a lot of my own clothes, and... I've sort of gone on strike against the clothes manufacturers and decided I'm going to start making my own clothes again That's because really cool. I don't like what they're using for yeah. fabric. It's all poly and I like, you know, I like to wear a cotton t-shirt and be able to go on a hike yeah. and not feel uncomfortable, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So. Very interesting. I'm so, I, so I'm sort of starting to sew the clothes again as well as the quilts. That's so. very cool. Yeah, I haven't done that yet, but I'm I'm on the verge, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I would love to um, connect to your cousin in, in, would you say it was Alabama? I would love to ca- connect and maybe chat in with her. In Alabama? In Huntsville? In Huntsville. Yep. That would be great. I would love to interview her. Yeah, that she sews lots. She sews mostly clothes and kids' toys. That's yes, so cool. That's, I would love it, but I'd love to learn more about the makerspace and, and her thoughts yeah. about that and how, how what well, you know, I would just send her my way if you're cool with that. I would love to interview Will her. Do. Cool. All right. So um, intellectual property, that's what we're here for. <laughs> I always <Okay>. forget. <laughs> what role does, um, do you, what role does law play in your creativity? Do you have any worries when you're doing it? Do you worry someone's going to swipe your beautiful quilt sort of what role does uh what what does law how does law affect your what you do every day do well you... um yeah you worry that somebody's going to swipe your quilts but then i go yeah you know there's a hundred more in the closet quit worrying just let it go you know yeah um the other thing is is copyright yeah for um which is which is interesting because like a lot of the quilts that I make are somebody else's pattern. Mm-hmm. And I always give credit. So they'll usually have a little blurb and I say where the pattern came from. But I found out from somebody when I was asking permission to show a quilt using their pattern at a show, they said, could you please name your quilt the same thing as the pattern name so that if that's all people realize that they could still find the pattern. So it's sort of like an advertising for them. So I've taken to doing that. Like that's if nice. I make a quilt from quilt works or somebody else yeah. and it's an Amazon star, then I name mine Amazon star. And then, then I give away the attribution it. there. So the law doesn't, I mean, that's interesting. So their concern is not only the attribution of, them but they want the name of the pattern as well so that yeah, they can and so that they se- so that they'll sell more and then they'll be able to stay in business and make us more cool patterns yeah so i figure that's worth supporting yeah interesting um, i know i wouldn't i know that the like what was it who was it was that paul, paul Nadelstern. Nadelstern. Yeah. her carpet got put into uh, which is hal- hilarious because yeah. that's where the Houston Court Show is, yeah. and they put a pattern in a carpet in a hotel, right? Yeah, there. what is that about? Yeah, that's that cool. takes real guts. Well, right? I mean, like, come on, really? I mean, like, really? Do you know how many steps that that carpet had to go through? Like, somebody didn't say, "Hey, maybe we should get permission." Like, I don't yeah. understand. Like, that to me doesn't make any sense at all. Well, and I saw a T-shirt with her design on it, and yeah. you know, I mean, nowadays you can find whatever design you want on the internet. Yeah. And if you want to do whatever with it, the only way they're going time they're going to come back after you is if you're in a big public place where people see it and they figure there's a lot of money to be made by suing you. Otherwise, they're not going to bother. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So interesting. Um, now, does like when, when you're inspiration, tell me about like. Do you feel like you're, like when you're doing your applique work, are you using a pattern or are you doing your own sort of, like how? Um, I do I do some of both and I'm running out of patterns of other people that I like. So I'm starting to design more of my own. 
That's interesting. And do you feel like when you're designing that space of designing, and Susie, you've been designing too, like what I'm trying to understand is, you know, ideas aren't protected, but expression is. Where's the boundary between the idea, like, oh, the idea of a a star with applique flowers around it, that's not protectable, right? But the the beautiful quilt you made is totally protectable. I mean, it is protected. So where's that right. boundary, right? Like, when does it become like, oh, I'm now, you know, and does it matter, I guess? It also, that, maybe that's another question. Well, okay, so I have a, one of my quilts that's going to Houston this year was inspired by a class that I took last year. And class that I took last year, she taught us how to draw these kind of wonky houses. Uh And I ran with that. It was all my own drawing. Right. Um, It was, you know, something that was original out of my hands. Right. But when I went to enter it in Houston, I got permission from her to enter it. Because you felt like the idea was inspired. Did you say inspired by or? Yeah, it was inspired by her. I mean, it wasn't her work. I hand drafted the entire pattern myself. Right. But if you put a picture of her class sample and my quilt next to each other, they clearly belong together. Got it. It was the same style of, uh, so that's right. So you can see kind of the interesting problem, right? So when is it, when is it not a literal copy, but a copy of her work? When is it just the idea of the wonky houses? It's not a clear boundary. You know, it really isn't. It it isn't like. It really wasn't, but I didn't want to risk being disqualified for not having her permission right and it's not bad right I mean in some way it's good I mean I think a lot of ideas are based on another idea I mean if you look at the the history of artwork you know uh it you can see the ideas traveling across Europe you know and where they where they originated in Persian then they went across this way and you can see the same motif, and yeah, it changes a little bit, it changes a little more, and it changes a little more. And this is what the Scandinavians did with that same idea. Yeah, totally. So I think visually we're inspired by what we understand have seen before, and then we'll want, do a one-up on that. Yeah. And so I think, I think basically most of design is that way. Well, it's interesting. That- There's a concept in copyright called building on the shoulder of giants I mean and it's a, a quote okay. from something right and the idea is that everything we do is built on the people that came before us um, and that there's not necessarily that you do add a little originality of your own but that we can't not use what came before us because that's how we build yeah. culture building on the shoulder of giants and yeah. I think what's interesting about quilting is that we acknowledge our giants so the fact that Susie took a class from someone and then was building something else on top of it, then somebody else may see Susie's work and they build on top of it. Like that, it's just that we're more overt about it than maybe, say, a painter who also did right. the same thing but isn't crediting all the inspiration that is in that painting, I think. That's my latest theory is that we acknowledge our giants. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Does that does that seem does that make sense to you? Does that seem like? Yeah, yeah. And I think we... about it a lot when I'm working on a show quilt because the shows have gotten more specific about making sure that credit is given where credit is due. Yeah, and they will have you will have to have written permission from whoever it is to enter it and show. And most people. When you contact them, they are totally fine with it as long as they're giving credit. Yeah, that's attribution is what they it's care not about. not usually a problem. Interesting. Um, Interesting. I know I used a photo I found. I found a photo of a bird on the internet uh-huh. that I really liked. And so I emailed the guy who made the photo and said, I would like to use your photo as a basis for a machine applique bird of this type on one of my quilts. Would you give permission for me to use your photo as the basis for this? And he goes, yeah, fine, go ahead. Yeah, ask permission. So, just a lot it. of people won't do that. Yeah. You know? Do you think that should be part of the culture, the that we just ask, that we do what you did? I I wish it was part of the culture. I think, pe- I'm not sure that people all ask. No. I think any photo or anything that's out on the internet is 
but some I feel like there are people that feel that it's fair game and yeah. a lot of times I will let people look at my quilt and take a picture of it but if it's a show quilt I tell them you can't post that on the internet anywhere because I don't want people to see the image before it goes to a show yep. yeah right so you're contr- you're the copyright holder and you're controlling what is allowed with that image and that's what that's part of yeah. the copyright that's part of your rights the 106 rights that you get the right to make a copy reproduce it distribute it that's what taking a picture is all of that stuff right so yeah. that's really interesting that you're controlling that um yeah i so think i think you have to or else you know your, your show quilt to come up at the show and people say i've seen this image before right there on was, instagram there was one lady whose blog i read uh, her name is Beth Ann Nemesh, and she's a big show quilter. And she had a picture, um, she had posted, I don't remember if it was on her blog or on her Facebook or where, but she had posted a picture of a design in progress. Uh-huh. You know, this is what I'm working on. And somebody took that and made a quilt from it. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, finished it before she did because she... <laughs> She does a lot of very fine, <laughs> intricate work. That's like so, like, oh my god! She was madder than a hornet. <laughs> um, she does not post pictures of her work in progress anymore because of that. All right, so I have to tell you two ridiculous stories. First of all, so interesting. This, my sister, when I was um, in high school, we were fighting because we always fought. And so uh, we were fighting about something, and she laid out, she was really much more. Um, fashionable than I am so she laid out her outfit for the day and she went to take a shower and I put her outfit on and I left the house (laughs) it was totally retribution for the fighting that totally reminds me of that it's deliberate it's willful it is cruel um right totally like I can't imagine like and like how did the community respond to her the other quilt and did it was it entered in shows or like what happened to this? Like, the, I don't remember if it was theft. entered in show, but I know that Beth Ann saw a picture of it and she was not happy. No, no, neither was my sister. She was like, she still talks about that. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> it's like 30 years later. <laughs> We're like, oh yeah, I remember that. I was really mad. At I thought it was actually quite funny. She did not find it funny. I thought it was really funny. Um, well, that's really you know, interesting. But I think if you look at quilting or any other art form, yeah, like we'll look at other art and get inspired by that too. Yeah. And do we always give credit to what we got inspired by? Some people do. Some people may not. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and it's hard. I mean, if you think about... Like, that's the other side of it. Like, you really can't, you can't get credit to every single thing that has inspired you because it's a lifetime of inspiration and seeing something in a particular way or like, I don't know. I mean, I think, and also on the other side of it is the public domain. So some, and techniques, techniques are not protected. So, you know, if there's a certain way somebody does something, that's kind of the house thing. Like, it could be that the houses are just a technique as opposed to something protectable. But what I'm really interested in is the, you know, what's cool about quilting and that's not, I mean, that's so overt as opposed to other spaces is that we literally have a public domain set of blocks. Blocks that we all use and pull from. And oh, yeah. uh, that's a huge part of our world. So just because somebody turns a log cabin a certain way, they they have added something to it. But is that an idea or is that a protectable thing? And I am not so sure about that. You know, when does when does something become something common that we all can use? And I'm not I'm not I mean, I know legally when that happens, but I'm not sure what your thoughts are about that part. As far as I'm concerned, like say you take a log cabin block and turn it or add points to it or whatever you do to it, that's still in the common domain. Yeah. You're still adding um, to it. You're adding to the kind of conversation about our common yeah. pool of, of yeah. do you feel that and way? I with... think that's the way quilting got built up is, you know, somebody yeah. did a, right. a nine patch and somebody did a log cabin and somebody says, oh, let's put those two together and make a new block and and it keeps going and I, I that's part of the fun of it yeah but uh you know if somebody takes a double wedding ring and adds a flower into it is that a new pattern no yeah i think it's really interesting one of the problems i'm having with thinking this conceptually through is so the public domain historically is either facts or things that can't be protected 
right? Ideas, uh, right. formulas, um, that kind of thing. And then stuff that came that was under copyright but came out into the public domain. And what happened with most of the patterns, most of those blocks were put into magazines and other things and they yeah. were they were not renewed. So they liter- they're literally yeah. in the public domain. Legally, they're in the public domain. But then the question is, so that's cool. But what about like when we start to make new stuff now? You know, if you, Susie, make something and it's original, it's going to be protected for your life plus 70 years. And right. I think that as quilters, we want a public domain that grows a pool, a common pool that grows much faster than that. And so the question is, what is that common pool look like now? And what, what's in there that maybe is mm-hmm. technically still under copyright, but not really, because we all sort of see it as a common block, a common building block. How do we identify common building blocks as we go? You know? I don't know. I don't know. I think that for the stuff that you do, your books, all the free motion quilting stuff, yeah. I think that you all are making things that are in a common pool. The book itself is not in a common pool, right? Right. But, right. you know, whether it's you or Leah Day or Angela Walters, you're all giving us ways to make swirls and circles and right. whatever. Right. And I think right. that there is that common pool feeling to it that, you know, you're not thinking, I think, I don't believe that you want to lock up some particular design that you made no. in your book, no. right? No. Um, so I think that's where the common pool is right now, is that all of you people who are amazing at helping us figure out how to do free motion quilting, which I still struggle with, um, are making our new common pool that you could sort of see all these things. And again, it doesn't mean your book isn't under copyright or that we shouldn't pay you for your book. Right. But what you're teaching us is adding to our base of knowledge. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's amazing, right? I, I don't know. I find it kind of um, really gets me in my soul, you know, that like you are building the next big common pool of public domain materials that we all are able then to do these things and we become a, we're this incredible community of – common tools that we need to do to use to do this thing you know so what you do is super important I think you know on that level so that's all is he getting is he saying enough yeah he is (laughs) you know what you got the look of it's time to end and my kid does that same look and she's 15 so you guys are yeah, she's 15. Mm-hmm. She's away at camp at, at a poetry workshop for the first time in Boston, like really far from me. So, wow. Yeah. It happens. So you guys have both been wonderful. Any last thoughts before we end this lovely conversation? No. 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 <laughs> he read the last word. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, yeah. We had talked about I will be in Houston uh, and I have two quilts. So you wanted to do Facebook Lives. Yeah, we totally. So will I'm- you send me send me a um, an email? We're trying to get it all organized. Send me I when did. you're going to be there. And let's do Facebook Live with your quilts. And um, we're going to get a schedule so that everybody will know what we're doing. Um, and um, anyone else listening out there, if you happen to um, hear this conversation, um, if you are going to be in Houston, if you're someone we've interviewed or someone who wants to be interviewed or you want to come hang out with us, um, we're going to do a ton of stuff. So um, just contact me, uh, message me. Um, but I think that it should be really fun. I think Houston should be great. And I can't wait to stand by your quilt and have you tell us about it. How cool is that? <laughs> I totally was excited. All right. Well, I'm going to try to get these processed and up quickly, which um, if you saw the list of – I'm way behind. We have like 45 interviews that still need to go up. It's totally insane. Um, That'll keep you busy for a while. Well, part of it is that we're doing about seven a week, but we're only posting three. So this is a problem. Like, But I'm afraid to post five interviews. That's too many. Like who could who could, who could wants five interviews a week? That's totally insane. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. This, there's too many people to talk to. Like, how could you? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Right. Uh, all right. Well, you all are both. You, all three of you have been awesome. And I appreciate um, your time and sharing. 
and um, I will be send. You're cool with it, this going up without reviewing it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Fine. And will you send me um, some more pictures of your stuff? I mean, I got some, so I can put, post those. Will you send me a couple pictures of your applique? Sure. And um, and your will grandson's do. quilt, if he's willing. So I would love to have that on it as well. He can see it online. Cool. All right. Bye. 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 How long is that? So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people.